Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming today. My name is Connie Newman. Um, I'm an endocrinologist um, at NYU Medical School, and I am also a member of the AMWA Preventive Medicine Task Force. And it is with great pleasure that I'm here today to talk to you about new perspectives in obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. This is a really huge topic, and I'm going to mostly focus on obesity and talk a little bit about diabetes. As you know, obesity is one of the biggest um, public health problems that we have today, and it drives many other diseases, including diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. So we need to do a lot um, today to um, help treat our patients with obesity and also um, to, um, to prevent obesity, um, especially in our young people. I have, no, I have nothing to disclose, and um, I'm hoping that at the end of my lecture today you'll be able to take away these key points. That obesity actually um, is not a disorder of willpower, it is a disease associated with changes in adipose hormones, changes in gastrointestinal hormones, and defective signaling and hypothalamic pathways that are responsible for appetite regulation and energy balance. Obesity contributes to diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, arthritis, cancer, and other diseases as well. Effective treatment of obesity will decrease type 2 diabetes mellitus, it will help patients get off medications, effective obesity treatment will lower blood pressure and thereby um, by reducing um, the incidence of diabetes and reducing hypertension, obesity will decrease cardiovascular disease. First line treatment is always diet, increased physical activity, behavioral interventions, and also it's important to adjust medications that will cause weight gain. We now are very fortunate to have new medications approved by the FDA in the past few years that are useful in helping patients adhere to dietary recommendations and lose weight. But it's always important to consider the benefits and the risks of pharmacological therapies um, when uh, treating your patients. So what I'm going to try to do um, is talk to you a little bit about the prevalence of obesity and its complications, the pathophysiology of obesity, how we should assess and manage our patients um, um, with lifestyle management as first-line therapy, um, pharmacotherapy, and if there is time, I'll talk a little bit about bariatric surgery and um, its indications. So complications and prevalence. Well, if you look at these maps, um, it's quite clear that um, we didn't have as much of a problem in this country about 20 or so years ago in 1990. This, these maps indicate the prevalence of obesity, meaning um, prevalence of BM, high BMIs in patients in, in various states in the country. And the light blue color indicates that the BMI range between 10 and 14 percent. So you can see that most of the map was blue and white in 1990. It got more blue in 2000, but here in, 2000, in 2010, which is still five years ago, many of the states are dark, um, deep orange um, or lighter orange, so people, um, many more people are classified as, as obese. In fact, we now know that one-third of the United States adult population is obese, and another one-third is overweight. So this is a substantial um, public health problem. We used to think that the fat cell was just a place where you would store fat to use for future um, energy needs. But we know, now believe that the fat cell actually is a multi-endocrine organ, that it makes various hormones, such as leptin and adiponectin. It also makes inflammatory cytokines, and that these um, hormones and, and cytokines lead to metabolic changes and actually lead to many chronic diseases, including atherogenic dyslipidemia, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and that we can either treat these chronic diseases, which we do have to do, but we can also try to treat obesity, and by lowering body weight, we can actually improve um, the prognosis of patients with these chronic diseases. So obesity affects almost every um, organ. 
In patients who are obese, you can see stroke, cataracts, coronary heart disease, dyslipidemia, um, high blood pressure, pancreatitis, various cancers, uh, pulmonary disease, particularly obstructive sleep apnea, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, um, gallbladder diseases, there are various reproductive abnormalities, abnormalities in menstrual cycles, infertility, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and due to the mechanical burden of the weight, um, people with obesity suffer from osteoarthritis. There is a strong relationship between BMI and diabetes, and it's even stronger um, in women than in men. The gold line shows the um, relationship um, between BMI and diabetes in women, and you can see uh, from a BMI of around 22, as the BMI increases, there's a sharp increase in the risk of diabetes. In men, there is also an increase, but it's not quite as, um, as steep. And we do know that if we treat, I'm going to show you some data later, that if we reduce weight um, with lifestyle therapies or even with pharmacological therapies, and especially with bariatric surgery, we can actually um, improve glycemic control in our patients with diabetes. So now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the pathophysiology of obesity. And uh, what we like to talk about is the relationship between the gut and the brain. So what regulates food intake? Food intake is regulated by both the central nervous system and by peripheral signals. The central nervous system has a homeostatic system which regulates hunger and satiety. There's also a reward system which overrides the homeostatic system and causes food intake when people are not hungry. I think we all know um, what this is about from our own personal experiences. There are also peripheral signals. Leptin is produced in adipose tissue. Leptin um, regulates long-term body fat stores. However, in people who have obesity, leptin levels are very elevated, and we believe that they are resistant to the effects of leptin. Leptin would normally um, increase uh, sat satiety. There are also various peptides produced by the small intestine. There's insulin and other peptides produced by the pancreas. And um, one of the hormones that signals hunger is ghrelin, which is produced by the stomach. So there are many peripheral signals um, that contribute to um, um, appetite um, and satiety. And this schematic um, shows um, the uh, the hormone shows the various um, areas of the gastrointestinal tract um, and also the adipose tissue where various hormones are produced. And they feed, these hormones feed into receptors in the hypothalamus. Um, and in this way, appetite is regulated um, by these many pathways. And in the hypothalamus, uh, there are many neuropeptides produced, and there are pathways leading to other areas of the hypothalamus. Here I'm showing you. The arc Here I'm showing you the arcuate nucleus, okay, and this is the paraventricular nucleus. But the point of this slide is not so you can learn about all of these different pathways. It's just to get an idea that the regulation of appetite and body fat mass is very, very complex. So we also have learned from studies in rodents that hypothalamic neurons are damaged by high-calorie foods. And um, this uh, is an area in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus that is damp where the pathways are actually impaired when um, rodents are given a high-fat diet. And I'm just going to talk about one of the studies that investigated this. So this is a, st um, a study by Joshua Thaler and colleagues that was published in 2011. And they found that when they fed rats a high-fat diet, they found there was damage to these neurons in the hypothalamus. So in these rats and mice that were susceptible to diet-induced obesity, this high-fat diet caused neuron injury in the area that was critical for um, energy homeostasis. This occurred early on before there was substantial weight gain. And they're not, so it seemed to be an effect of this high-fat diet. They also looked at MRI um, of people who had obesity, and they found there was evidence for changes in the, in the hypothalamus. They found gliosis in the hypothalamus of, of humans. So obesity is associated with hypothalamic injury, 
and this affects our sense of satiety. Um, some people have proposed this feed-forward mechanism, which explains why people keep gaining weight. Um, their weight keeps going up, up, and up. It starts out um, by eating here, high-fat, high-carbohydrate food, and then as a result of that, there would be, it's hypothesized, there's hypothalamic injury. Some of the neurons um, in the hypothalamus and the arguin nucleus are damaged. They're no longer functioning. In the periphery, there's resistance to leptin and insulin. So what happens is the brain just can't tell how much fat is stored, and everything works against you to eat more, and your fat mass is, is increased in order to restore equilibrium. So p people have a reduced sense of satiety. They have more cravings. They eat more. They gain more weight. And this produces more hypothalamic injury and greater resistance to leptin and insulin. And this is known as the feed-forward um, mechanism to drive weight higher. We also know how difficult um, it is to lose weight. And this slide illustrates um, a study in which uh, people who had a mean BMI of 31 were put on various diets, low-fat diet, a Mediterranean diet, um, and a low-carbohydrate diet. And you can see that they um, lost a substantial amount of weight here, but gradually the weight began to creep back up. So why is it? Why is it that people have so much trouble losing weight and, and maintaining the weight loss? Well, I'd like to share with you a study which was done by Sumitran and colleagues and published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2011, which tried to explain this a little bit. So they studied 50 men and women who were obese, um, and the men um, had an average weight of 233 pounds, the women 200 pounds. And these um, patients were put on a very low calorie diet with Optifast shakes and some vegetables, and they were taking in only um, 500 to 550 calories a day, and this for eight weeks. So at 10 weeks, there was a 30-pound weight loss, um, and, but a, a year later, um, 11 pounds had actually been regained. And these patients said that they reported feeling more hungry and more preoccupied with food than before the weight loss. So this slide shows the 30-pound weight loss in these um, patients in this study and then this gradual 11-pound weight gain at the 62-week uh, period. And what they found is when they measured various hormones that are involved in appetite and satiety, that there was a change at 62 weeks in the hormones um, that encourage, in hormones so that weight gain would be encouraged, weight regain would be, um, would be encouraged. There was reduction in appetite-suppressing hormones at week 62. These included leptin. There was a 36% uh, decrease in leptin. There are also reductions in peptide YY, cholecystokinin, insulin, and amylin. And there was an increase in appetite-stimulating hormones, such as ghrelin, pancreatic polypeptide, and gastric inhibitory polypeptide. So this 14% weight loss produced changes in eight hormones that encouraged regain of weight. So the weight regulating system is actually biased. It's biased in favor of weight gain and against weight loss. Um, there is hypothalamic and, and neuron injury um, in, in obesity. So we now believe that obesity is not merely a disorder of willpower. Obesity has a physiological basis. and um, <coughs> We um, have to be on the side of the patient um, against the disease. We have to support them and help them in this very difficult battle to lose weight. Obesity is now recognized as a disease by the American Medical Association, um, which passed a resolution in June of 2013 saying that obesity is a multi-metabolic and hormonal disease state with characteristic signs and symptoms, and that increased fat mass associated with obesity is directly related to comorbidities such as type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. And since the AMA passed this resolution, many other societies listed here have um, 
agreed that obesity should be designated as a disease. And I just want to point out that there is now an American Board of Obesity Medicine that if you're interested in this field, um, you can actually study to be um, for your boards and become certified in obesity medicine. I think we have close to 1,500 physicians in the United States who are certified obesity medicine specialists. And if you want to learn more about this, you can visit the website of the American Board of Obesity Medicine at www.abom.org. So I want to now switch to obesity management. How do we screen our patient? Who should be screened? Who should be treated? What interventions work? What's the right diet? And how much physical activity do people need? The US Preventive Services Task Force recommends that all adults patients should be screened for obesity. Oops, something. My slides. All adults should be screened for obesity, and they should be offered intensive counseling and behavioral um, interventions. So which patients should be treated? Well, patients who have a BMI between 25 and 30 are considered to be overweight and not obese. But if a patient has a BMI of over 25 and is not yet in the category that we classify as obesity, they should still be treated with, with lifestyle changes, meaning a reduced calorie diet, physical activity, and behavioral modification. You can add pharmacotherapy to achieve greater weight loss in patients who have BMIs between 27 and 30 and one comorbidity. And by comorbidity, I mean diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, sleep apnea, and, and other conditions. Oh, you could also um, add pharmacotherapy to lifestyle changes in patients who have a BMI over 30 and do not have comorbidities. So when do we consider bariatric surgery? Well, bariatric surgery is generally um, considered for patients who have a severe obesity, BMIs of 40 or more, or for patients who have BMIs between 20, 35 and 40 and one comorbidity. So when we assess our patients um, um, who come in um, with weight problems, it's important to estimate their height, to estimate their BMI by measuring their height and weight, to check their weight circumference, to review uh, their medical history, um, assessing the comorbidities, um, and to look for causes of obesity, including other medications that can cause weight gain. It's important to assess the patient's readiness and motivation to lose weight. Um, if the patient is ready, you should agree with them on reasonable weight and activity goals and write them down and um, develop a treatment plan that the patients agree with. It's important to be empathetic and, and supportive with your patients. In terms of diet, I, I, I just want to mention that a diet does produce um, proper diets, produces about 5 to 6 percent weight loss, but it's much better, as shown in the red line, to combine diet with exercise. So how much exercise is needed? The CDC recommends moderate intensity exercise, 150 minutes a week or 30 minutes per day for five days. And this can actually be increased to 60 minutes per day um, as the, pa the patients can tolerate it. If you can substitute vigorous intensity exercise um, for moderate intensity exercise, and that would be 75 minutes a week or 15 minutes a day for five days. It's also critical to have our patients um, um, do strength training exercise two or more days a week. And I just want to mention that walking is a very good exercise, and the ultimate goal would be to walk 36, 30 to 60 minutes a day. And in terms of diet, um, look, diets, there are many different diets out there. Um, as long as the diet is low calorie, low in saturated fat, perhaps lower in, in, in glycemic, in, in using low, lower glycemic index foods, the diet would be healthy. But what's really important is that how the patient adheres to the diet. And this, the graph on the right shows that Patients lost the most weight when they adhere to the diet. So the best diet is the, is the diet that the patient likes the best. In terms of um, behavioral interventions, it's important in patients who have obesity to institute comprehensive and high intensity um, behavioral sessions, um, at least 12 to 26 a year. You can talk about weight goals, improving diet and nutrition. You can talk about um, physical activity, barriers that are preventing them from losing weight, 
self-monitoring and strategies for maintaining their lifestyle changes. Um, it's also important for everyone um, to weigh themselves at least once a week, and it is very helpful to record the amount of food and the amount of calories um, that you eat every day. Weight loss maintenance is very difficult, and it's um, critical as physicians that we follow our patients after they've lost um, weight so that they can keep um, the weight off. So now, I, with a few minutes remaining, I hope to give an overview of some of the medications that we have for patients with um, type 2, uh, for patients with obesity. I just want to say that before prescribing medications for any patients, there are a lot of medications that cause weight gain, and they're, they're, it's probably hard to see, but I just want you to look at that when you think about that when you're prescribing medications to your patients. For patients with diabetes who are overweight or obese, metformin is the best first-line treatment. Other treatments, um, drugs that are good for patients with diabetes that would not um, have them gain weight would be the GLP-1 agonists and the SGLT2 inhibitors. Insulin, sulfonylureas, and thiazolidine diones may cause weight gain, so they should be avoided. I'm going to have to skip over some slides because of um, the time constraints. Um, this slide just to show some data with this SGL2 inhibitor canaglyphosin, which causes glucose excretion in the urine. And you can see um, about a, a, um, a 2.5 to 3.5 percent weight gain um, with this drug in patients with diabetes. So we now are very fortunate to have five drugs that can be used for long-term therapy in patients with obesity. The first drug on this list is uh, Orlistat or Xenical. This was approved in 1999. This is a GI lipase inhibitor which blocks fat absorption. Um, the other drugs are Phentermine topiramate, which was, which was approved in uh, 2012, which is a neuroadrenergic agent and anti-epileptic anti drug which increases satiety. Lorcasserin, a serotonin 2C receptor agonist, also increases satiety and stimulates alpha MSH. This was approved in 2012. In 2014, um, the FDA approved a combination of naltrexone and bupropion for weight loss, and this is an opioid antagonist and a dopamine norepinephrine inhibitor, which decreases appetite and also has effects on the reward system. And more recently, in December, um, liraglutide, which is a GLP-1 agonist, was approved in a three milligram dose just for the treatment um, of obesity. Um, and um, liraglutide is also improved in lower doses for the treatment of diabetes. It affects appetite. Um, I wanted to mention that when you're thinking about that you shouldn't be using these drugs unless you're really familiar with them and have been educated with them because they all have various side effects which are listed on this slide. Um, and. Um, all these uh, obesity drugs are contraindicated in pregnancy. I just want to go through some of the um, contraindications. So phentermine topiramine is contraindicated in, in hyperthyroidism and use of, in, with monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Um, Lorcasserin is contraindicated um, and when, with use uh, with serotonergic or antidopaminergic drugs. Um, and um, naltrexone bupropion is contraindicated in patients with seizure disorder, uncontrolled hypertension monoamine oxidase inhibitors, um, and liraglutide is contraindicated in patients with a personal or family history of medullary thyroid carcinoma. And these anti-obesity medications can be used as an adjunct to lifestyle therapy, and they usually produce a weight loss ranging from about 3 to 9 percent on average, but actually the weight loss is even greater um, in, in some patients than that. Yes. So um, when the FDA approves um, drugs for the treatment of obesity, they approve them on, based on these criteria, that the mean placebo subtracted weight loss should be 5% or greater, or that the proportion of drug-treated subjects who lose 5% or more of weight is 35% or greater, and approximately two times the proportion of patients who lose 5% of weight in the placebo group. Um, this um, just summarizes the prescribing information for lacastrin. I just want to point out on the right side that all of the warnings for this drug, which you need to read in the label. And I wanted to show you this data from the Bloom study, which is very interesting. And um, you could see that in these patients 
were all, this was the, were randomized to placebo and there was very little weight loss, or they were randomized for one year to lercaserin and they stayed on lercaserin for year one and two and there was about a six, seven kilogram weight loss. But in those patients who were randomized to lercaserin in, in the first year and then switched over to placebo in the second year, there was a weight regain. So it's generally felt that when a patient is put on an anti-obesity medication, they may have to continue the medication for a long period um, in order to maintain the weight loss. Otherwise, they would have to really increase their exercise program and do something to, um, to maintain the weight loss. So many patients are on these medications for long periods of time. Um, I also wanted to point out um, that there are studies with lorcasterin and with some of the other anti-obesity um, drugs that show that there is a decrement in hemoglobin A1C in patients with diabetes, and there's also um, a decreased use in diabetes medication. So the, but this weight loss um, actually improves glycemic control in patients with diabetes. I'm going to talk a little bit about fentramine topiramate. Just want to show you this data. This drug um, in this study, fentramine topiramate, caused about a 9% um, decrease in weight in a two-year period. And again, in, in, the, in the sequel study with fentramine topiramate, the incidence of diabetes was 3.7% in the placebo group, but it was reduced by about half in patients on the lower dose of fentramine topiramate, and it was reduced by about 75% in patients on the um, highest dose of fentramine topiramate. Here's, I um, just wanted to share with you this data on liraglutide 3 milligrams, which is one of our newest drugs approved for the um, treatment of obesity, showing about a 6% weight loss over a period of one year. And again, here's um, data for the naltrexone bupropion combination. So in summary, for the medical management of patients with obesity, you should avoid medications that cause weight gain. You should definitely start with lifestyle modifications Diet, physical activity, behavioral changes are always first-line therapy. But when further weight reduction is needed in addition to lifestyle changes, because lifestyle changes usually produce about a 5 to 6 percent weight loss, um, when further reduction is needed, you can consider ph pharmacological therapy. Weight loss medications on average can cause 5 to 10 percent additional weight reduction. But it's also important to remember that in patients who are on a medication for three months and do not have a 5% weight reduction, that medication should be discontinued and you should start another one. It's also very important to remember that you have to choose the right medication for the, right, for the patient depending upon the patient's other diseases. You have to look carefully um, at the side effects and the warnings for each medication and consider the risks and benefits. <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about bariatric surgery before I close. It's indicated for patients with severe obesity, a BMI of over 40 or a BMI over 35 with one comorbidity. Um, you can use, a, the FDA recently said you could use a lap band in patients with a BMI over 30 um, and, and one comorbidity. And the various bariatric surgery procedures are illustrated here. The Roux and Y gastric bypass, the gastric band, which is not as effective and the vertical sleeve gastrectomy are the most commonly used procedures. And importantly, I wanted to show you this data showing that 15 or 16 years oops, sorry, sorry, um, out, there was a decrease in mortality in patients treated with bariatric surgery. And the most weight loss in this study was in the patients who had the gastric bypass. Um, in addition, I'll skip to this slide, um, in, in, in a long-term Swedish obesity study, they found at 15 years that in patients treated with surgery, there was a 30 percent remission in type 2 diabetes in the surgery group versus 6.5 percent um, in the control group. So bariatric surgery is actually a very effective treatment for type 2 diabetes. So I'd just like to uh, close with the key points that I mentioned earlier. I hope I've tried to show you that obesity actually is not a disorder of willpower. It's a disease associated with changes in adipose and GI hormones with defective signaling and hypothalamic pathways, 
responsible for appetite regulation and energy balance. Obesity contributes to hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, arthritis, cancer, various other um, comorbidities that I showed you on one of my earlier slides. Effective treatment of obesity does decrease type 2 diabetes, it does lower blood pressure, and it thereby can reduce cardiovascular disease. And I just showed you data for bariatric surgery showing a decrease in mortality over 16 years. Uh, first line treatment for obesity is always diet, increased physical activity, behavioral interventions, and adjusting medications that cause weight gain. There are now new medications that can be used long term to control appetite. So the, the four medications that I was talking about are all control appetite. They don't actually burn fat. And these are useful in helping our patients adhere to dietary recommendations and lose weight. And when considering pharmacological therapy or surgical therapy in patients, you should always consider the benefits and risks. And you should be very familiar with the drug labels for each of the drugs if you're going to use them. And last, I wanted to thank you uh, for attending this lecture. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Louis Aroni from Weill Cornell Medical College, who has um, taught me a lot about obesity medicine. Um, and I want to thank um, the AMWA Preventive Medicine Task Force for their work on obesity. And I also want to thank the Endocrine Society, of um, which I am a member. And I wanted to mention that at our Preventive Medicine Task Force table, we treat obesity seriously. We have an obesity pledge there, which I hope you will come by um, and sign, um, which basically states that I believe obesity is not a problem. It's a disease that warrants serious evidence-based treatments, nutritional and physical activity guidance, behavioral counseling, drug therapy, and surgery. I agree to learn more and to help more. I treat obesity seriously. Thank you very much.